Matt Delahunty saying, quote, I don't make arguments against veganism, ellipsis, ever, ellipsis, but I'm starting to think that eating meat is required for clarity of thought. Oh, 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 Matt, old boy. Oh, Matt, you're 50 years old and you don't really know where milk comes from. Oh, Matt, we just saw you doing a two and a half hour debate that was ever so erudite and one-sided in which you ultimately couldn't do anything but plead ignorance. Oh, oh, oh Matt, you old rib tigler, you. Matt, you dirt ignorant Texan ex-military know-nothing, no-talent bum. Why, why is Matt Dillon taken seriously? Why? He became a radio personality in Texas, on Texas community radio, on the basis of nothing. He became known and to some extent respected for, on the one hand, you know, being an agony aunt, that's an old-fashioned slang term, listening to people and their problems over the radio, which is, you know, when people called in and said, boy, I'm really upset because I've quit the church and now my whole family hates me, doing that kind of sympathetic a reception call. And then on the other hand, he really, he just bullied people on the phone. It was really, I mean, there's, there's no reason to respect this guy intellectually. There, there never has been. I, I don't make arguments against veganism, ever. Oh, 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 Matt Delante continues. And you still failed to accurately represent my position. Have some bacon and try again. Oh, 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 oh Matt. Oh, Matt, you slay me. You slay me with your refined debate stylings and sensibility. Could this be the same Matt Dillahunty who took on the erudite Richard, I think high school dropout, vegan gains, and managed to lose and then lie about it on the internet later in his latest interview with Cosmic Sky? He says, oh, well, yeah, you know, uh, uh, vegan gains, he had some really bad arguments. And in fact, he even agreed with me. Yeah, right, Matt. That's how that conversation went. Jesus Christ. Anyway, to wrap this up, Matt Dillahunty's quote continues. Yet more confusion and assertions when the reality is that I'm correctly applying the burden of proof, which, if you could meet it, oh, oh, oh another little witticism, if you could meet the burden of proof, M-E-A-T question mark, oh, 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 oh Matt Dillahunty, oh, If you could meet that burden of proof, you wouldn't keep need to tweeting against straw men. Adios. And then, oh, oh, here's the big conclusion. Moral obligation versus moral virtue. Learn that first. So look, it's possible for me to imagine a conversation in which Matt Dillahunty was really using this distinction of moral obligation versus moral virtue to, to solve a problem. That's what philosophy is supposed to be all about. And he's not. I mean, this is a totally snide and insincere, you know, dismissal of, uh, of the problem. Now, also the concept of burden of proof. Sometimes burden of proof can be very important, scientifically, philosophically, even legally. <laughs> this, this is a joke. This is, again, this is just totally insincere, um, you know, dismissal of veganism, basically. And again, we've just seen recently how totally incapable he is of taking on, taking on those kinds of questions, those, those kinds of problems. If you've been watching this channel for a long, long time, I actually discussed the ethics of the fact we had a, a leader in the vegan movement. We had a guy here on YouTube who photographed himself wearing a Nazi t-shirt. And I point out, look, you know, what we're really judging here is not that the t-shirt does any harm. Because a lot of people use kind of phony utilitarian ethics here. The t-shirt did not kill millions of people. Buying the t-shirt doesn't give money to Adolf Hitler or the Nazi party. He actually, in that case, made the t-shirt himself. <laughs> Why is it so immoral? Why is it ethically such a big deal that he wears this t-shirt and approves the t-shirt? It's because the judgment we're making is on you. It's on the kind of person you are and who you aspire to be. The, the judgment here about Matt Dillahunty is about what kind of man are you? <laughs> you know, that's ultimately what this is. If you go around wearing a t-shirt that says, I don't care about greenhouse gas emissions, pork and bacon or something. If you wear a t-shirt that says chicken wings for life or whatever, I don't care about heart attacks. You just wanna eat beef. You don't care about animal rights. You just want to eat deep fried chicken. That tells me a lot about you, Matt. It tells me a lot about your morality. 
And the way you so cynically invoke, you know, moral obligation versus moral virtue. Which again, from what I've seen, I, I, I don't, okay, if this were, you know, a legitimate area of philosophical inquiry, if this was a philosophy that really meant something, what problem does it solve? What is the research question that is addressed by this? Now, really, really briefly, I have been in several debates about the existence of objective morality um, with people who were sincerely interested in talking about it. And one of the things I point out in those debates, this isn't the end of the discussion, but I say, look, suppose you have two people and one believes the value of art is completely subjective. It can never be you know, fully specified, iterated, or it can never be made objective. That ultimately beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Whether or not something is a great painting depends on different kinds of cultural and interpersonal and maybe even economic and aesthetic considerations that ultimately are utterly subjective. They're no more real than a dream. People decide the Mona Lisa is a great painting and then it's a great painting because a bunch of people feel that way and that's about it. Um, and people can change their minds. A work of art, a film, a movie is considered the greatest film of its era, and 10 years later, doesn't seem so great anymore. That, that, that's it. There's nothing objective. And then suppose someone else enters that, that debate, that discourse, and says, no, they feel really strongly that there is a, an, objective, an objective set of criteria that define some films as objectively good films and some as objectively bad, some paintings as objectively good, that there is some spectrum of objectively real criteria that can establish whether art is good or bad. Even if that were conceded, unless their position is that all art can be objectively uh, evaluated this way, then the argument is ultimately ridiculous and spurious and immaterial. Because, look, if you take a, a great painting, if you take the Mona Lisa and you light it on fire and then you, you display the burned ruins, the burned remains of the Mona Lisa, can you make an argument that objectively it's not a great painting anymore? <laughs> like, it's not visible anymore. It's been charred and, and you know, it's, it's been damaged beyond recognition. Oh, okay, so gee, we seem to be dealing with an objectively real criterion of something being a good painting. Like, you can see it, you know, like, oh, okay, a great work of architecture still has to be standing and not destroyed in an earthquake. A great film, you know, <laughs> yeah, we've been watching Game of Thrones recently and the lighting is so bad. You know, okay, so maybe there are objective criteria for lighting and uh, color balance, you know, <laughs> something like this. Once you're into objective criteria, you're never going to be talking about the range of things that we're really debating that really matter in real life in art. So really, really briefly, if you have a bunch of applicants for a scholarship, let's keep it on the same topic. You have a bunch of aspiring young painters who send in their best works of art, send in their drawings and their paintings, and say, hey, I want a scholarship to go to uh, arts college. I want an opportunity to study at some, some art academy. You are not going to be debating. If you are on the committee who chooses the winners and losers, choose who gets the scholarship and who does not. You are not going to be debating objectively great art and objectively terrible art, because I'm being objectively good and bad art. If any of the applicants are so terrible that there's no debate about it, that it's in that realm, then those are not going to be what your attention is focused on. If any of them are so wonderful, it's like, oh, wow, this kid is amazingly fantastic, then they're in the pile of people who are definitely getting the, the scholarship. All of your time and energy is going to be on the cases that are near the borderline, near the cutoff, where it's like, well, look, we only have 50 scholarships. We can give 50 students a chance at this education. So you're probably not even going to discuss the best 40, and you're not going to discuss the worst 200, however many you got. Okay? There are going to be just a couple of cases near the cutoff line, and all of the time and effort of the committee is going to be directed towards that. So this brings us back to a, a case like Cuba, a case like Iran, okay? Cuba is not Nazi Germany. It's not, there aren't gas chambers. There isn't a Holocaust going on there that's so unbelievably awful that it justifies invading Cuba and shutting down the gas chambers. If it were, it wouldn't be difficult to talk about, right? Human rights problems in Iran, they're bad, not remotely as bad as Nazi Germany. It doesn't cross any of the thresholds where you can say, okay, look, they're digging mass graves. This is a situation so extreme that we have to have war and intervention, okay? The other examples I used, prostitution. 
the view of the left wing and the right wing and the center on prostitution. It's a problem. The corrupting influence of prostitution in society, whether it's, you know, my ex-girlfriend going to her high school and there being recruiters there, or actually I've heard that a lot about uh, Japan too. There being kind of recruiters on the streets of Tokyo. Okay, you know, there are, there are these, you know, troubling questions about prostitution. But this is not in the realm of some kind of objectively real humanitarian disaster where we then don't have to have the conversation. Uh, okay, drinking water is poisoning people and they're dropping dead in the thousands. No debate. It's an objectively real problem for government policy. Government's going to intervene. Guess what? Even if it's counter to your constitution, if you happen to be living in a country where, like, let's say that it's said in the constitution, the federal government will have nothing to do with drinking water, that remains the municipal government's problem. It's just for the city government. Doesn't matter. They'll send in the FBI or the CIA or they'll send in the National Guard. They'll send in the army. They'll do, oh, wow, people are dropping dead because there's a drinking water problem. We're into the realm of objectively real problems. So again, oh, at what point is it a moral obligation as opposed to a moral virtue to have government intervention, to have policy intervention, to have these kinds of political interventions? It's irrelevant. Those are never going to be the cases we're paying attention to. We're always going to be looking at questions of virtue, and we're going to be looking at the most dubitable, the most doubtful, the most, you know, the, the, the gray areas that are the hardest to deal with, right? I, mean, I, don't, I don't see anyone really sitting around wanting to morally ponder whether or not you should have a, an intervention when it's an absolute clear-cut case of mass poisoning, mass murder or something. You know, okay, these are these are areas where we need, you know, government intervention as, as soon as well. Even uh, an earthquake, that's uh, the earthquake that destroyed Haiti, I forget how many years ago now. Okay, gee, we need we need some some kind of intervention. Okay, you know what? I've been to downtown Los Angeles. I've been to the, I've been to the beach. Where was that? Venice Beach, Los Angeles. I could take some photographs of Venice Beach in Los Angeles where the humanitarian disaster looks worse than some parts of Haiti after the, the earthquake. You know, you got people, you know, sleeping on the street, sleeping in tents. You got, you got a kind of slow motion humanitarian disaster in Venice Beach in Los Angeles, right? We're never going to be discussing or debating the, 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 the situations of moral obligation. All of these debates are going to be in the area of moral virtue, and they're going to be in the most gray the most indecisive, the most difficult areas of moral virtue. Okay, look, guys, I'll wrap it up for this video there. Um, Matt Dillahunty always was an idiot. His whole line of approach on objective morality and moral obligation is not a philosophy. I would go so far to say that this is an anti-philosophy because it's doing the exact opposite of what a philosophy ought to do. Philosophies are about problem-solving methods. They are not about obfuscation. And all he's doing with his quote-unquote philosophy is obfuscating and evading the point when he is presented with a genuine philosophical problem. And compared to the future of Iran, the future of Cuba, the future of Venice Beach, Los Angeles, or the future of prostitution, veganism, veganism has got to be one of the easiest moral quandaries to think your way out of. Someone who dodged the call from Vegan Gains again and again and again until he was, you know, Vegan Gains was trying to set up an appointment. Someone who's dodged, you've spent your whole life dodging these questions. That, that's what you are, man. Matt Dillahunty, you are a moral and intellectual coward. And yet you've made a career out of grandstanding on what you yourself say is one of the simplest issues in the world to grandstand on. You think you're a genius because you figured out that when you pray to God, nobody is listening. Well, clap, clap, clap. You caught up with something most of us knew at 12 years old. And that doesn't put you in any position of moral leadership. It doesn't make you an intellectual. It doesn't make you a philosopher. It makes you a pathetic, self-important, dried up Texan military man. And I know, we all know, but after he did the, the radio show, he used to post where they would go to, go to dinner after the radio show, he said, oh, supporters of the show can come and eat here. You can see the fucking menu. And Matt, if you got to age 50 and you never really sat down and wonder, oh, where does cheese come from? <laughs> You're still catching up with a whole lot of stuff that we knew at about age 12. And um, 
ultimately, the purpose of philosophy is not just to understand the world. Um, it's to change it. I don't know how you've managed to go so far as a public intellectual while having absolutely no positive vision of the future, of the world being a better place, and of what you've got to do, the sacrifices you've got to make, the kind of commitment and hard work you'd have to do um, to accomplish it. It's just, it's just too much to ask for Matt Dillahunty to stop eating bacon, to stop eating cheese. Um, Matt, when you read the history books, who, who do you look up to? I've never heard him talk, I've never really heard him talk about books he read in that way. He really seems to me a kind of illiterate troglodyte, to be quite honest with you. But like, you know, if, if you, who, who, are the, who are the heroes now for people in secularism? I mean, is it, you know, is it Galileo standing up and dying, you know, for what he believes in? Is it Socrates? You know, Socrates who ultimately was put to death for what he believed in. You know, whose shoes would you walk a mile in, Matt? I mean, is it, is it somebody like Martin Luther King, whose life, again, died with a bullet to the head? But who before that went through, I mean, you know, Matt, if you believe in this cause, this benighted cause you've, you've chosen for yourself, I think it's time for you to, to stand up and start being a little bit more of a heroic figure. If not at age 50, you know, you know when is it going to be, Matt? <laughs> da, 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 da.